On behalf of my beloved Adrian, we say thank you for your warm welcome. And I want to do something slightly unusual, but I realize there's one person who couldn't be here with us today who was originally to be here, Casey Choi. I interviewed with Casey uh, while uh, going through the job interviewing process. As I think most of you know, he's had a, an unfortunate turn of health and is not able to be with us. And I'd like to ask you to bow with me and to offer a prayer on his behalf. Our gracious God, you created us and breathed into us the gift of life. We cherish the life that you give us. We are deeply grateful for the friendships that give so much meaning to our lives, that enrich us and help us to understand what it is to be human. And on this occasion, we ask for your special blessings on KC. We pray that you would surround him with your love, that you would bless all of the decisions that the physicians and the nurses who attend him make and restore him to his health. We thank you for him we thank you for all who serve you through this institution, and we offer our prayer through our Lord. Amen. Amen. I had a very unusual experience once. I was <clears throat> invited to have dinner with a group of Bedouin in the Negev, the very southern part of Israel. It was an unforgettable dinner, the best lamb I have ever had in my life, I will just say this. But towards the end of the dinner, they served a cup of coffee, and when my coffee came, there was only a half a cup. And Arab coffee is pretty strong, but I love strong coffee. <laughs> and looking at this half cup, which I had watched them roast earlier and smelled it as they roasted it over the fire, the beans, and then they ground it. I finally just couldn't resist. I asked my host, I said, I'm really sorry, but can you tell me why you're only giving us half a cup of coffee? And he said, yes, it's quite simple. If we give you a full cup of coffee, we're signaling to you, that's all. Drink it and please leave. If we give you a half a cup, it means we'd like for you to stay around. We will be back to pour you some more. <laughs> and so I said, thank you for the half cup. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say on Adrian in my behalf, thank you for the half cup of coffee that you have so generously extended to us in the way that you have welcomed us to this community. We feel truly blessed to be with you and to be a part of you. I am a New Testament scholar and biblical texts tend to come to my mind when I think about events in life and I thought about this one as I thought about you. It comes from Romans 12. Let love be genuine. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. You have extended hospitality to us as newcomers, to Yale. Uh, maybe I should tell you this much about myself. My grandfather actually attended Yale University, but his name was not Sterling. It was Hugo Stamps. His family had 
done quite well uh, early in the 19th century with motels in Iowa. And then they bought a large department store or some store in Boston. And he'd grown up in Boston, gone to private schools, you know, in a well-to-do family, come to Yale, went back to Iowa to visit family, and fell in love with an Iowa farm girl. His family did not approve of the social station of his love. And after a series of exchanges that were less than pleasant, he disowned his family and changed his name from Hugo Stamps back to what I was told was an old family name of John Sterling. Uh, I don't know if there's any relationship to the Sterlings who gave the money to this quad, but I have to find out. <laughs> uh, at any rate, that's my only connection to Yale until now, but we are thrilled to be with, here, with you here. Let me say just a few words about what we're currently doing this year in the Divinity School. And some of these will be immediate, some of these will be long-term. And then I'd like to give you two challenges and let you ask whatever questions you'd like to ask. So the first thing that we're working on this year is the issue of race and relations. We think we need to be more diverse than we are. So we have four initiatives underway. We hired a group of people called Allies for Change who came to campus and worked with the faculty for four hours and all of the faculty attended and were engaged in this from four till eight uh, one evening working on how we can foster discussions of race and relations in our classes. They came back a little over a week later and spent the entire day with the students on Friday, October the 12th, working with the student body. This is one way that we are trying to open up the conversation and make it possible for all of us to confront differences and to think through what does it mean to be a person with white privilege? Uh, why do we always expect somebody who's not white to bring up the issue of race when we ourselves are identified by race as white? We had some rather candid exchanges among the faculty. They asked us to share embarrassing moments, and faculty did share embarrassing moments when things didn't go quite the way we had hoped in a classroom setting. We're trying, we're working. The second thing we're doing is we have purchased and distributed the book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. All faculty, all students will read this book and then the author will come in February and we'll have a campus-wide discussion of it. The third thing we're doing harkens back to my own days as a doctoral student when I was at Berkeley is we've invited Alan Bosak uh, to come and to tell us about the situation in South Africa. And I say it harkens back because I'm old enough that when I was a student at Berkeley, I did go to Sproul Plaza and help support the protest to divest uh, the holdings of the University of California in companies that supported uh, apartheid. And the final thing that we'll do this year is to devote the spring issue of reflections to the issue of race and relations. It's tentatively entitled, Preparing for 2050, Race in America. Uh, we will find ways to continue this. This will not exhaust what we're going to do. This is just our way of starting this conversation this year, not that it's never taken place, but this year in a serious way, and we will think about extending this in future years so that we become a place which is more diverse than we currently are. The second thing that we're thinking very carefully about is denominational diversity. 
It comes as no surprise to you, and if you heard my installation address, you know that I'm deeply concerned about the decline of mainline Protestant denominations. Uh, many of us have been nurtured by these denominations, and they mean a great deal to us. We currently have, if you look at the Book of Numbers, about 86 uh, Episcopal students, 42 Roman Catholics, and the number that's really growing, and I expect this number to explode, are the interdenominational uh, students at 26. What we don't have is another large group of Protestants uh, to, to help balance the heavy weight of Episcopal and Roman Catholic students. I mean, I am very grateful for BDS. And I served for 23 years at this country's leading Roman Catholic university. I'm very fond uh, of the Roman Catholic uh, tradition in many ways. But we need to have another group here that will represent Protestantism and help give some balance for the sake of discussions in class, uh, for the sake of discussions among students. So we are working on ways that we can do that. We now have, and this has already been in place, but we do have programs for Methodists, for Lutherans, and for Reformed traditions. But we have some other things that we're working on uh, in quiet ways right now to try to find some ways to bring in another significant group of Protestants to our community. The third thing that we're deeply concerned with is church renewal. This is directly related. We will use YDS as a platform for discussions on how can we renew and revitalize mainline Protestant denominations. This is not yet set, but we hope this spring we will host a debate, and I will tell you that one of the participants will be Dorothy Bass. Uh, the other will be one of her critics. Uh, that's not yet finalized, but that's one thing. We will invite church leaders to help us think through what we can do uh, to help foster church renewal. We have two possible chairs in the offing. One that is called evangelism, and this does not mean standing on a street corner handing out tracts. It means renewing churches uh, and revitalizing churches. And another in youth ministry that we hope will come to fruition. We don't have firm commitments, but we have people who are very serious about that. And a third thing that we will do along this line is I, if this meets with your approval, it has met with the approval of the faculty and with the board of advisors, I propose to establish a task force of six people, two faculty, two members of the board of advisors, and two alums, to look at the possibility of creating one-hour classes in which we would routinely bring in to this campus leaders in different fields who operate with a Christian perspective or at least an ethical perspective that would be sympathetic to Christianity. What I mean by that is we would certainly invite people in like a Nancy Taylor, uh, for example, who is a very successful UCC minister, but I would like to get Clyde Tuttle to come in, an executive of Coca-Cola, who is an alum. I would like to get Carolyn Wu, a dear friend of mine, who was a dean at Notre Dame and now heads Catholic Relief Services worldwide, to come to talk about how their faith has shaped their lives in the way that their careers have led them in very different directions. I would like for us to have maybe someone like uh, Yvonne Chouinard come back and talk about Patagonia. What does it mean to lead a company when you make decisions based primarily on 
how you treat your employees, and the impact of your company on the environment. So my vision is that we would have, on Friday nights and all day Saturday, one hour classes, they would be honest to goodness classes, that would be case studies with people from a wide range of disciplines uh, who would come in and model in front of our students what it means to lead in their area thinking through a Christian lens. So that's another idea. The fourth major area, and I'm going to just say this because I know all of you are thinking about it, is what are we going to do about the three apartment buildings? When I said to the Board of Advisors that they only have five years of life left, uh, the room erupted. <laughs> and they said, they only had five years left 15 years ago. <laughs> well, in reality, they have about five years until we either close them down or invest millions of dollars in them. My dream, and at this point it's a dream, is to take them down and build a green village. And by village, I mean a place in which community is built and is fostered and is tied in to the back end of this campus and will be a place where we mirror our values by being green and restore a sense of community that I know meant so much to many of you who lived within the quad. That's going to be a very expensive proposition. Uh, and I'm saying that we will work on this and work towards this over a five year period to have the plan laid out to be able to start doing something in direct ways within five years. The last thing that I hope, and I'm going to put this on the back burner because I have too many other things that I want to address my attention to at the present, but I'm going to mention is that I am hopeful that someday we will add a sixth area to our studies that I'm going to, for the time being, call comparative theology. I don't mean the study of religion in the way that it's done in the Department of Religious Studies or what happens at Harvard Divinity School, but I mean how do we as Christians think of our faith in light of faiths around the world? And it really doesn't matter whether you live in Manhattan or whether you live in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I have no idea what the population of that is, but it's not real large, I don't think. Wherever you live, you have to worry about how do you, if you're leading a congregation or a parish, talk intelligently to people about Muslims, about sheiks, about Jews. And how do we as Christians think about them? How do we relate to them? We live in a global context, like it or not. I want this to be the place where we think about Christianity globally and work out an understanding of what it means to be Christian in a global context, which includes our dialogues with other faiths. So those are the big things that I will say for the time being. What are the immediate challenges? There are two of them, and I'm going to ask for your help. First of all, if you look at the book of numbers that you have in front of you, you'll notice that our enrollment numbers went down. And, you know, <laughs> figures are always tricky. One of the things we don't have is an official statistician. So I always get different numbers when I ask for a question, and it makes me think of that old line that figures don't lie, but liars figure. 
Uh, well, these are pretty close. But what's happened in the last two years, we became a little too selective. And in becoming too selective, we lowered the number of students that we took, and we've created a significant financial problem. So we had planned, Harry very shrewdly had laid out a plan when everything was booming uh, by setting money aside for some reserves and then when the market tanked and we lost not quite but almost a hundred million dollars just think of taking four to five million dollars out of the annual budget just whoosh, went away uh, when we lost that money built in a plan to spend some of the reserves to spend it down but what happened was we took a nosedive in enrollments, and instead of having a deficit of about $360 million, we ended up with a deficit of $849 million, or forty eight hundred $849,000, excuse me. Yeah, we, we wouldn't be here if it were the former. <laughs> uh, $849,000, and there isn't a lot that I can do about that this year. We're going to have another significant deficit. And we have reserves. We're capable of uh, covering that, and I applaud Harry, uh, and I have told him thank you more than once for his prudence in setting aside the reserves, but we can't live like this. We have to change this. So. One of the things we will do is we've already set now quotas for the number of students we're going to try to admit each year. We've determined that our maximum capacity is right at 400 students. That's how many students we think our facilities, our faculty, and our staff can serve and can serve adequately. So we will admit 65 Master Divinity students 65 MARs, and 15 STM students a year. Now what that means, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, why, why even with MARs and MDivs? Remember an MDiv is three years, an MAR is two. That means 195 MDivs and 130 MARs. So the bulk will always be the MDiv. That's very deliberate uh, on our part. If we have a year where we have a stronger pool of people in the MDiv category, maybe we'll admit 85 instead of 65 and fewer MAR students that year. I mean, those numbers could vary a little bit, but those are now our targets of the numbers that we're going to try to reach and that is going to help us. So here is my first appeal to you. Help us recruit. You know this school. You believe in this school. You know young people who are very talented. You know who the creme de la creme are in the colleges around you. Urge them to come to YDX. That's something that all of you can help us do. Be our ambassadors. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You already do this. But I'm saying it is especially urgent uh, right now that we make a serious effort to recruit. Please help us with that. The second area, and this will not be of any surprise, deals with the financial side of this. It cost for someone to attend this year $41,643. Now that's not tuition, that's tuition and living expenses. That's, if you were at Yale College, I don't even think that would be tuition. But uh, our tuition is much less than Yale College. Uh, but that's what it costs, which is a lot of money uh, for people at this point in their life. If you're married, it's $49,239, and if you have a child, it's $55,000. $485. Those are the official numbers that we use for financial aid. 
it's very expensive. Debt is a problem that we all think about and worry about with respect to our students. The mean debt, mean debt, not median, but mean, debt of students entering YDS in 2011, the last year for which I have this, was $28,124. That's coming from their at undergraduate schools. The mean debt incurred at YDS was $34,477, and the total mean debt is $50,317. Now, if you're a physician or an attorney, that's not even the price of a Mercedes. But if you're a pastor or a priest, that may be an annual salary. You know, or, or close to one, depends on where you are. I realize some make more than that in large urban areas. But it represents a lot of money to people who work for not-for-profits and serve churches, especially when we realize that most of our graduates are going to end up in small rural areas. So I am asking you to do all that you can to help us in two ways. First, with their annual fund. And I, I want to begin by saying something that I'm very pleased to be able to say. The alumni of this school have the highest percentage of alums that give to the annual fund of any seminary I know. We beat Harvard, we beat Chicago, we beat Duke, we beat Emory, we beat Vanderbilt. We beat all of those in the percentage of alums who give. And I celebrate you for doing that. But I am also appealing to you as the leaders of the alumni. I'm assuming all of you give. I mean, you're already here. But to help reach out to your colleagues and urge them to do whatever they can I will continue the policy that Harry said, every dollar that is given to the annual fund will go directly to financial aid for our students. It won't go to an endowment, it will go directly to the students that year. So you can be sure of that, we will take nothing out of that, it's all for financial aid. And I want to say a very special word of commendation to Gail Briggs who's done a wonderful job with the annual fund. I, I think she deserves a lot of it. One other way that I ask you to think about your alma mater is when you write your will, think about your alma mater. Connie who is sitting back here, has done an absolutely superb job at uh, helping us. We now average about $500,000 a year in bequest coming to the school. So take care of your families. Take care of your primary obligations. I'm not asking people to be irresponsible. But I am saying, when you think about your wills, please remember that what you're doing is you're helping the students who will someday sit where you're now sitting to fund their education so that they can have the life that you've had. That's what I'm asking you to think about. When she was senator, Senator Hillary Clinton wrote a book, all of you know this book, entitled, It Takes a Village. And the point of her book was that a parent or two parents are not enough to raise a bright child to make them resilient and give them all the chances they need to flourish in life. It takes a whole community to make a first-rate school. This is not just about administration. It is not just about faculty, as talented as they are. It is not just about the students, as good as they are. It is about all of us. 
and it takes all of us to make this the institution that you dearly love, that I and Adrian are falling in love with, and for which we will work as hard as we can. Thank you for all of your support and your help.